Hello. Thank you for attending our webinar. We, today we will mention the materials and methods used here uh, for these experiments. We are going to discuss why we want to run focus gradients rather than isocratic methods. We will discuss the different ways to calculate a focused gradient from a scouting run, including the iterative method most many of us have used. We will show you zones which are commonly used in many labs, the accelerated retention windows and related scouting delay estimates, and the time on target algorithm, a new method to calculate a focused gradient from a scouting run. And we will end with a discussion of how any of the techniques in the list above may not produce the expected results. AccuPrep HP150s were used for preparative HPLC with UV, purine L-mass spectrometer, and evaporative light scattering detection. Analytical scouting HPLC used ReadySEP analytical columns, either 4.6 by 150 or 2 by 150 millimeter. Agilent 1290 and 1100 systems were used for some of the scouting runs, but the AccuPrep was also used for scouting runs. Although Teledyne ISCO systems and columns were used for this webinar, the techniques work for any preparative LC system. We want to run an efficient purification. This means that it is fast, the peak doesn't take very long to elute, and it uses minimal solvent and time. We need method development that is easy. Method development should use very little solvent and sample, and it should take as little time as possible. And the method development should fit into your existing workflow, where one may do an analytical run to verify a compound was synthesized and check its purity. You may like to use that analytical scouting run to determine your purification method. A focus gradient is flat, and there isn't much difference between the starting solvent composition and the ending solvent composition. The range is usually 10 or 20 percent B. Such a shallow gradient provides a similar resolution to that of an isocratic run. A focused gradient allows for variation in temperature from one day, one, yeah, from one day to another when purifications must be run at different times. A focused gradient also allows for some changes due to chemistry, as we will see later. We have here a scouting run from an analytical system. We want a method to reliably, quickly, and easily calculate focused gradient methods. The first of these is iteration. Assume a 20 by 150 millimeter column for the time and solvent estimates. Uh, make a guess, do a run, and repeat until it is good enough. You will use at least half a liter of solvent and 17 minutes for each attempt, and it uses a sample for each run. Uh, you're running on a preparative column, so you need more sample. The rest of the methods to be discussed can use an analytical column to create the scouting run, so they don't need much solvent or samples. They, knew they do need columns that match. The brand and chemistry should be the same. For example, use a ReadySEP C18AQ analytical column with a ReadySEP C18AQ prep column. You can still use the prep column for both the scouting and prep run. The me next method, zones, is also very commonly used. Some of you may have a chart like this in your lab. Each zone in this chart represents a different method on the preparative LC system. This is easy to run once it is set up, but the gradient isn't optimized for any particular compound. If this gradient, at, if this compound at six minutes, or this compound at eight minutes are the compound of interest, they will elute late in the gradient on your preparative LC system. And this gradient at 10 and a half minutes will elute early in the, in the gradient. 
the generated gradient methods aren't optimized for any particular compound. It takes a bit of time to determine the zones and a change to either the analytical or prep system means a new chart needs to be made due to dwell volume differences between the systems. We will discuss dwell volume later. You need to set up five methods for each column on the prep system. Ionizable compounds at the ends of the zone may be problematic because they may not elute when expected. This problem is common to all calculated gradients and we will discuss this later. The next method we will discuss is the accelerated retention window algorithm. This is a more complicated technique. First, a scouting run is run on both the analytical and preparative LC system. Correct the preparative run for the draw volume of the preparative system. The draw volume is the volume between the gradient former and the top of the column, and you need to measure it for this technique. Create a graph that relates the solvent composition to the time the compound elutes from the analytical column. Use the same scouting gradient in the first step, run your sample, and determine the retention time. Use the equation in step six to calculate a solvent composition, which is the center of your focused gradient. M and B are the slope of the intercept of the line in the graph. RT is the retention time on the analytical run, and the value delta is determined by trial and error. This varies by column and instrument and your desired retention time. A change in system requires a new calibration. That one works well, but it is a bit complex. Other methods are related to accelerated retention window, but are a little easier to implement. All of the calculated methods stem from the observation that the program scouting gradient seems to be delayed. The question is how much of a delay is there? None of these compounds shown here need 100% solvent to elute. This is a mixture of parabens, methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl paraben. The green line is the gradient shifted by the dwell and column volume. If you have a waters system, they use the term extra column volume for dwell volume. The second peak looks like about 85% B solvent after correcting the gradient for the dwell and column volume delay. But that, composition, but that compensation isn't enough. The compound elutes very early. An additional delay is required. Earlier work calls this additional delay several names such as correction factor, delta, or mixing volume. I will show you that the blue line is simply the time to run the sample down the prep column. Teledyne Isco explored this type of calculation and found it wasn't generic. A change in system needed a new correction. With this additional correction, the second peak is expected to elude at about 65% B. These mixing volumes are difficult to determine because they vary by instrument and column, but the extra delay by, by whatever name gives us good chromatography. The previous methods didn't translate well to flash chromatography. Chromatography is chromatography whether it's flash or preparative LC. The corrections for mixing volume were determined by trial and error, and the draw volumes of the instruments needed to be determined. There is an easier way. Set the retention time to a desired value with a model compound usually six minutes on a 150 millimeter long column, and note the solvent composition that causes this retention. Using a matching analytical column, run a scouting gradient with the same compound using the same solvent system, including any modifiers. Note that there is no isocratic hold at the start of the gradient. You will see none is needed. After the run is completed, Note the retention time of the model compound. The universal test mix used with Teledyne ISCO systems has two compounds useful for this purpose.
The time the model compound elutes is considered to be the same solvent composition as that determined in the isocratic run. The analytical system and gradient is now calibrated to match the performance of the preparative system. <clears throat> After initial calibration, a user can change solvents and modifiers for their compounds as long as the same gradients are used on the analytical and prep and the same scouting gradient is used on the analytical system that was used in the calibration. DA is the time difference between the program gradient and the apparent gradient. Any change to the scouting gradient or analytical instrument just needs a new run with the model compound to determine the new apparent gradient delay and is very simple. The internal scouting runs on the AccuPrep have the calibrations done for you. You need matching columns, which means matching chemistry. Run a ready sub C18 with a ready sub C18, a ready sub C18 AQ analytical with ready sub C18 AQ prep, and Phenomenex lunar analytical with a lunar prep column. The target compound, the co target column may be the same one as used for the scouting run. This is useful if you have a preparative column with a unique chemistry and no matching analytical columns. One would just inject a small amount of sample for the scouting run. In this example, the peak at 5.8 minutes was chosen. This is the third eluding peak. We also made the analytical calibrations easy, so an analytical scouting run for most analytical HPLC or UHPLC can be used to determine AccuPrep-focused gradients. Now that we know many different ways to create a focused gradient from scouting runs, let's see what, atten what affects retention of uh, compounds we want to purify. The two most common factors most people will see are from sample loading and from running ionizable compounds, which can be in different forms depending on the pH of the mobile phase. We'll do sample loading first. The first injection, the green trace, was a one mil injection of a sample dissolved in DMSO. It has baseline resolution. Inefficient preparative purification has the peaks barely touching. Now let's try to increase the loading to 2.5 mils. We see that the peaks now run together. And the first peak runs into the DMSL solvent front. The purity and efficiency of this purification suffered badly. When the sample is dissolved in water at the same concentration, we get the same resolution as before when we injected one mil in DMSO we get more than double the loading. Generally, if the sample can elute in 20% or less organic solvent, it is likely to be water soluble. Alternatively, make the sample as concentrated as possible to minimize the volume of DMSO or DMF used. We also see the same sort of effect if the sample is dissolved in a B solvent such as methanol or acetyl nitro. Many times the compounds such as acids or bases elude at a time other than the calibrated six minutes. Most of the time the elution works fine and this is one reason that we use a focused gradient. Sometimes they elude at a very different time. Any of the methods described earlier may show unexpected elution with ionizable compounds. We will see how using better pH control may make the retention more predictable. Unionized compounds are less polar and elute later on reverse phase. The graph shows the concentration of salicylic acid ionization states as a function of pH. Modifiers make the solvent system more polar, so neutral compounds might elute just a little later. At low pH, salicylic acid is mostly unionized and is a neutral molecule. It elutes late from re reverse phase. In mid-range pH, the carboxylic acid is ionized and the compound elutes earlier, being more polar. At high pH, the phenolic group is also ionized and the compound elutes earlier still.
Let's take a look at an alkaloid, quinine, in this sample. The top runs are scouting gradient runs, and the bottom runs are calculated gradients. Quinine eludes too early in the prep run without a modifier in the lower left corner. Note that if you change the solvent or modifier, you will need to run another scouting gradient. See the differences in retention times in the scouting runs above. This is true for any of the methods that we looked at earlier. The quinine eluded just a little late with 0.1% formic acid, but it is still a good, uh, useful run. Let's look at an acidic compound, salicylic acid. The scouting runs are on top. No modifier was used for the left side run. The solvent system was water methanol for all runs, but the runs on the right used 0.1% formic acid in both solvents. The scouting gradient peak shape often gives a clue that the prep run may not work well. Note that the compound eludes from at about seven and a half minutes when run with formic acid. Compounds eluding at the ends of zone methods may not elute during the focus gradient, and is, it is better to try to optimize the gradient for each compound of interest you know, using another method than zones to create the gradient. Let's go back to our old friend quinine. The top run is 0.1% acetic acid, and the scouting run, the scouting gradient in the middle is 100 millimolar ammonium acetate. The bottom run is the calculated gradient from the buffered run. 50 to 100 milligrams quinine is 4 to 8 millimolar in the eluding band, while 0.1% acetic acid is around 5 millimolar, so there is more quinine than acid. 100 millimolar ammonium acetate, pH 4, the retention is 6 minutes, the same as the calibrated retention time. This shows that proper pH control can cause ionizable compounds to elute at the expected time. There is good peak shape. 0.1% modifiers do work well enough. Most compounds will elute on the gradient. But uh, this experiment, again, shows that proper buffering creates the correct elution time. Again, note the change in the scouting gradient and the modifier change. The previous run was 30 to 40% B. This run is 45 to 55% B solvent. And this is also reflected in the different retention times observed in the scouting runs. In this example, a customer needed to purify bromocresol blue. TFA and formic acid failed to resolve the mixture. In methanol, the focus gradient generator eluded the compound on the gradient but with very poor peak shape. Acetyl nitro, the compound eluded late from the focused gradient. The peak shape in both scouting runs give a strong clue that the chromatography will not be good for a focused gradient. There is a nonpolar salt tone ring at low pH. We needed methanol due to the buffer solubility instead of acetyl nitro. Buffering at pH 2 with phosphate gave usable chromatography with greatly improved peak shape. These runs use synthesized epidermal growth factor receptor variant 3. The first run uses the, column, the common water acetyl nitro modified with 0.1% TFA, that is trifluoroacetic acid. The calculated gradient in the center shows a late elution. The peak shape is a little odd too, although that might be due to the step gradient as well. A slight adjustment to the focus gradient causes a nice elution. Odd peak shapes of ionizable compounds suggest pH issues. The mass spectrometer trace suggests that the same compound is in multiple peaks. This suggests that the compound has multiple stable ionized states under these conditions, each with its own polarity and its own retention time. This is because TFA is not a buffer in preparative HPLC. TFA is about 6 millimolar concentration at 0.1%. For this run, only 50 milligram peptide was injected with a mass of 1635 grams per mole. It comes to 0.03 millimole, which doesn't seem like much. This, however, is ideally eluding in the volume of about 20 mils or one fraction tube. 
So the concentration is close to two millimolar within the peak and is one third the concentration of the modifier, enough to deplete the slight buffering capacity of TFA. Injecting more peptide will make the situation worse. Analytical HPLC injections contain so little material that the TFA can control the ionization and pH is not affected. Without the mass spectrometer, one might think that the other peaks were impurities. Those peaks might not be collected, so that material would be lost, lowering your yield. Let's try a buffer, but now I need to make some changes to my solvent system. Ammonium acetate is soluble in the presence of methanol, but not acetonitro. The focus gradient generator worked first time in this run. However, we still see multiple peaks in the UV and mass spectrometer traces. We will try a lower pH since this peptide has a PI of 4.5. This is the pH where the positive and negative charges on the peptide balance out, so it has a net charge of zero. I like to be more than one pH unit from the PI because small changes in pH can cause the peptide to have something other than net zero charge, causing changes in retention time. To lower the pH, I use ammonium formate, which buffers at pH 3.5. The peptide elutes as a single peak now and is mostly resolved from impurities. This purification would give both good purity and recovery. I used ammonium acetate and ammonium formate because they are volatile and can be used with the mass spectrometer. Since this is a preparative LC system, only a tiny portion of the flow, microliters at any one time, gets diverted to the mass spectrometer, so I can use 50 millimolar buffer. The buffer gets diluted by the carrier solvent that delivers the sample to the mass spectrometer. These buffers, being volatile, can also be removed during lyophilization, making cleanup post-purification much easier. In preparative LC, removing salts or other modifiers always needs to be considered. TFA, formic acid, and acetic acid can be added to both the A and B solvents. Depending on the concentration, the UV cutoff may not be bad. In other words, it might not hide your compound. For preparative chromatography, volatile buffers are easier to remove. These are the ones that are friendly to ELSD and mass spectrometer in the table uh, shown here. If a non-volatile buffer is needed, the purified compound can be run to a column again without a buffer. Since the compound is purified, the peak shape is no longer important. We just want to remove the salt and then collect the compound. So what happens during the gradient? Compounds are going to ionize less when we go to less polar solvents. The equilibration shifts from less polar forms and they retain on the compound better. With a given concentration of ammonia, the pH decreases in the solvent system. It becomes less polar as in a gradient. An acetic acid solution also tend to higher pH as a proportion of the B solvent increases. The buffer has less of an effect while the compound we want to purify also tends to be less ionized too. This changes the adsorption during the gradient. Sometimes if one has access to a column which is stable under basic pH conditions, it is better to run a basic buffer for more predictable chromatography. These would normally be polymeric reverse phase. A very few silica columns also can stand basic pH, but read the instructions because most silica-based C18 or reverse phase columns dissolve under polar basic solvent conditions. To summarize this section, recovery is improved because of improved peak shape. The entire peptide is in a single peak, not in several peaks. We see this issue with preparative chromatography because the sample concentration is so high compared with analytical techniques. In analytical chromatography, the, N, the modifier concentration is usually very high compared to the sample concentration. And now we can take your questions.
Hello again. Uh, can you hear me now? I just got a message that people could not hear me. Yes, I can hear you now, Jack. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. And I will answer the first question over again. I mentioned an example with appropriate buffering with 100 millimolar ammonium acetate. Could I please explain further? And did I compare with 100 millimolar acetic acid? Uh, the answer to that is uh, I did not compare it with 100 millimolar acetic acid. That probably would have worked uh, pretty well for that particular situation. Uh, what I was trying to show was that if I buffered the solution, I could force a compound that was ionizable to elude at the time we calibrated uh, in the uh, focus gradient generator. Uh, with uh, the when I used TFA, the peak came out at a reasonable time, and I was just showing how uh, with a little bit better buffering, uh, the calibration works uh, correctly again. Uh, another question that I have is, could I please show and explain the equation for calculating a gradient again? Uh, I see your name over here, and uh, what uh, if you left your email when you signed up for the webinar, what I can do is send you uh, the uh, reprint of the paper where I uh, generated that equation. Uh, Next thing is, uh, what are some clues that I need to add modifier or buffer? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, peak shape's a good clue. If you have poor peak shape in your scouting run, you're almost certainly going to have poor peak shape uh, with your uh, focused gradient. Uh, another hint is if you have an analytical system with an auto sampler, many of them allow you to run the same sample under three different solvent conditions or two different solvent conditions and uh, one run after the other, and if you see a significant change in retention time or peak shape, that's a clue that you might need to at least run it with a modifier. Another question that I have is, okay, I use these buffers, how in the world do I get rid of them? Uh, for the ammonium acetate buffer, TFA modifiers, uh, those are volatile and you can pull them off uh, when you lyophilize. Alternatively, we know that the compound retains on C18 because that's how we purified it. And once we've removed the compound we want from the impurities, uh, we can run it again on C18 without modifier and the bad peak shape doesn't matter so much because we don't have any impurities to co-elute with our compound. So just run a gradient uh, just from well, 5 to 100% B without any modifier. And uh, you, the salts will come out at the uh, void and then you could collect your peak. Do we have any other uh, questions, please? Uh, again, I apologize for the uh, issues with the audio and the video. Uh, it was working fine locally over here, and I suspect it's a Zoom issue uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, another issue uh, uh, locally here. Do you match, recommend match length in your scouting column or just match chemistry? Uh, just match chemistry because uh, we can run from uh, a uh, small two by 50 millimeter UHPLC column and uh, we would then uh, scale up actually to a uh, three kilogram, 3.8 kilogram flash column and that works very well. Uh, one thing that is kind of important maybe is pore size because uh, our work with peptide indicates that pore size can affect the uh, retention greatly. But uh, particle size uh, seems to be uh, okay too. You can use different particle sizes. <laughs> 
can extra modifier be added to the sample to compensate for the relatively low uh, concentration in the mobile phase? Uh, you might be able to try that. Uh, however, uh, that's essentially what we're doing, but a buffer also lets you have a lower concentration of uh, something added to your mobile phase, and it tends to help correct the pH. Uh, I'm surprised that different charge states would separate in LC. Shouldn't the acid-base equilibration of the charge states must be faster than the separation? Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Sometimes it happens very, very quickly, and you do get a single peak. Uh, sometimes uh, the equilibration uh, might be very quick, but you have states that are stable enough that you will get uh, multiple peaks, and I've seen uh, sometimes where uh, it looks like a suspension bridge where I get the uncharged uh, molecule eluding first, then it tails, and then uh, you see a tail that doesn't quite reach baseline, and it goes up again, and uh, that's the uh, charged uh, version of the molecule. And uh, like I said, it kind of looks like a suspension bridge without the uh, ends on it. Uh, Again, uh, I was surprised that the peptide acted in that uh, fashion myself, but the mass spectrometer uh, only is going to give me that particular peptide since I was working on, I believe it was the uh, uh, 3M plus H. So there aren't too many uh, impurities that would match that particular mass spectrum. Uh, a mixture of uh, 10 to 1 formic acid to TFA that avoids ion uh, suppression effects of TFA. Uh, any experience on that? Uh, I've heard the same thing. Ion suppression tends to be a mass spectrometer issue, and I think you're describing what is termed the TFA uh, fix. And uh, again, uh, I've heard of it. Uh, we haven't run into it in our labs. But uh, I'm not going to say that uh, there's some people who have run into it, and that is the fix that they use. Why ammonium acetate is hygroscopic and stored at 4 degrees C? Isn't ammonium formate better? Uh, it depends on the pH that I need as much as uh, anything, and that's how come I tried the two different uh, buffers over there. Uh, if I uh, had to choose uh, to use just one, I would use, I think it's the ammonium formate at around pH 2.8, pH 3, uh, since uh, it will ionize just about everything. Uh, why often get better peak shape is ammonium salt is present. Uh, I'm going to uh, guess that you're describing with a buffer over here, and again, uh, it's just because I have a little bit of buffering capacity. As my molecule sucks up some of the acid, uh, the ammonium uh, or, or uh, uh, acetate or ammonium formate, uh, that concentration will shift a little bit to uh, uh, restore the equilibration of the uh, acid so as to maintain the pH. Uh, 